Hello everybody, it is July 12, 2020. It's Sunday, it's about 1830 CDT. It's like 85 degrees Fahrenheit out in the Geo Lab right now, so you can hear the AC running. I apologize. We are going to be talking about a certain microscope that I use for analysis today. We'll get to this, but it really helps in analysis. So, we're going to be testing the Galesville sandstone. And you can tell it looks pretty orange. Uh, I have a bigger block over here. This is me mechanically breaking it back down into a sand. Here is the bigger continuous piece. All right, it's, it's somewhat friable. It is indurated pretty good, but you can mechanically break it down with minimal effort in a mortar and pestle. Gales Hills, Cambrian and Age. And I took this sample in order to do a grain size analysis. A grain size analysis is a mechanical way of determining, well, basically what you're seeing here. I have more sieves than this. These are just the ones that are out. The problem with doing a mechanical grain size is if you're, your medium, what you're doing, well, number one, if it's a real hard rock, this isn't going to work. But if you can break it down like you can at Galesville, if you have lots of silt and clay, you don't want to use this. This isn't going to work. It's really hard to mechanically break that stuff down. Sand stuff is sand sized stuff and pebbles and cobbles. That's fine. That breaks down pretty easily. All right, so you run your mechanical sieve analysis, okay? And my Galesville was done, and this is my lab book. It was my first lab book. I'm on, I'm on number two now, which is this one. These things fill up pretty quickly. But this is basically my hard notes in the Galesville. This is the plot. It's very unimodal, right, for sandstone. That means it's, in geology, we call that well sorted, which in engineering USC is the exact opposite of well graded. See, that's the problem. I'm speaking from a geology standpoint here, not a civil engineering standpoint. Talks for other times. And as you can see, the sieve size here that I use, use US sieve numbers. They are totally different than an engineer would use because the engineering USCS system, I'm just going to touch on this, this is taught for another time, is based on industry standards as where here we base it on the phi scale. That's why I have the phi here, which is, which is a very logical scale. Uh, grain sizes are broken down via that way. And the number 230 is about the smallest the human eye can see unaided. Okay, so there's no need to come back to the phi, okay? That was just to show you why it's up there. The US sieve size, these are standard numbers. These are their sizes in millimeters. You can see four, two, one, a half, a quarter. So it's a, this is half of this, this is half of this, this is half of this. See, it's a, it's a lot more logical system. It, th this is half of this. I'm not taking it to a third decimal place. I only did it to two, but it is, etc., etc. And these are the Wentworth sizes. We in geology we use the Wentworth scale. So anything in between, anything retained on the number ten, but passing the number five would be what we call granule. And depending on the nature of our sandstone, we can either include that with our sands or with our gravels, which are not on here. In my sedimentary lab reference book. This is pretty much the breakout here. I'm just going to show you page 11 and 12. All right, that's the Wentworth scale broken down. You can see corresponds somewhat with that. And this is just perfectly spherical objects at certain grain sizes. All right, and as you can see, that's real hard to see. But we'll get to that when we get to the microscope. So there's our Wentworth sizes, which means our sands are here. Okay, they do make sieves smaller than the 230. Uh, there are 400s and stuff, but the mesh is so small and fragile, it's not worth the effort. You can do uh, other tests to determine this, and you can do civil engineering tests to determine that. But that's our sand interval. And as you can see, over 90% of all of our sand is fine to medium, and they're close. That's why, that's why you get that nice unimodal peak that I showed you right here. That's why you get this nice peak. I am not doing a civil engineer analysis, so these percents are not cumulative. All right, I'm just doing percents like that so I could get that graph. So most of our grains are right here. 
over 90%. You can see that almost all the rest are in coarse sand. So if we include this, that's almost 100%. As you can see from the mechanical sieve analysis, you do lose some. What happens, and this is actually a pretty good number. I got 99.9%. Uh, 100 is what you want to shoot for, but the raw numbers, when you run these sieves, sometimes grains get stuck in the mesh. That's why when you run these mechanical sieves, you want to have as much as possible. I think this is between 220 and 225 grams of material. That's a good enough size to get a number close to 100. But if you start working with 50 grams, 30 grams, you're going to get less because more is going to get stuck relative to the amount you have. So when you're doing these, you want as much as possible, but I wouldn't do much more than this because the finer sieves can only take so much weight and then you can tear the mesh. Based on our mechanical sieve analysis, you can see that this is a well-sorted, it's not very well-sorted, but it's a well-sorted sand, indicating that it's been transported decently. The fines have been removed, the courses have been weathered out, and it turns out this is a quartz aronite. This sandstone, the Galesville, which we're going to confirm with this, is almost all quartz. And some of the grains are frosted, and I've talked about in other lectures why that is. The Cambrian Galesville, which this is where it butts up near the Baraboo quartzite in the, in the, in the uh, Baraboo range on the north limb, it's aeolian. It's windblown deposits against the quartzite so you get a very clean sand so this this sorting is about as good as nature gets the saint peter which is a talk for another time is a little better than this but this is almost 100 percent quartz and we're going to verify that with this this is our microscope i keep it in here it's a relatively recent purchase it comes with a stand a couple stands it is this is the charger plug this in any USB you can charge this I got this job this is these are not terribly expensive this one was $50 it's a little more than the cheapest ones the cheapest ones will run you about $20 but they're usually only compatible with like an Android phone this is compatible with my iPhone the Android phone uh, a PC a Mac anything it's good for all of that because you have to download an app in order to use this to get your to get what you're seeing and I use this for geology now it comes with this here it's a little plastic cover you have to take it off and you use it there's your microscope and it shines lights on what you want to do first is turn this on I'll talk about its magnification in a minute you hold that down you get the light you turn the app on from there. You go into your phone, activate the wireless. It doesn't have to have an actual wireless connection. It'll work if there isn't one. And then you go to the app and you can see what you're looking at. Okay, so as you can see here, it says 50x to 1000x. It says that's our magnification. 50 to 1000 times is its claimed magnification. That is not entirely true. What happens is when you turn this, this is how you move it, all right? When you, when you put it on your surface, I generally try to have a piece of white paper, clean white paper in the background, or if something's really light, a black piece or dark piece of paper. Uh, you don't want to use something that you, that's going to interfere with it. But it's, it's not exactly 50 to 1,000. Depends on what you're looking at. As you zoom in, you're going to get better zoom in on a flatter object than you are a, a bigger, taller, spherical, cubical object or whatever because there's less topography. But generally, I've done the calculations. This, this generally is 20 to about 40x on the low end. And you use it, you do that, and you'll do this. And then to get that other lens to kick in, to get it on the, high, on the higher end of magnification, you have to move it significantly far there'll be nothing in between then you get to your higher magnification that's how you do it that's how you zoom in and it gets to about 800 to 900 x usually it's closer to 800 sometimes it's like 780 something like that but that is more than good enough what you're seeing here are some of the galesville slides you're seeing the stuff under the low end the 50x part and the wide 
thickest width of this is about seven millimeters. And as you can see, you can see these grains pretty good. And for most things I do, that's good enough. Now, if we go to the higher end on that, we go to our 1000 on that, what you see is you see the grains are a lot closer. It's a little harder to focus. The long edge here, the longest edge here, and this is about two millimeters, it's a hair less. So that's a really good magnification. That's enough to see things like face mites on your face, which admittedly I have tried doing, but alas, I have found none yet. So you're looking at your screen. When you have the app on, you will see your screen, and your screen ratios are 16 to 9. When you're closer to the 50x, this length is about 7 millimeters. Okay? That's about your field of vision. And of course, as you get further away from the center, it's going to blur a little bit. On your 1000x, which actually isn't quite 1000x, and 50 is usually a little less than that, you are going to get across the board, it's actually just under two millimeters. Uh, the, what I actually used to measure, was I had this down and I looked at it, zoomed it as much as I could, and as you can see those lines, for the 50X, it's easy to tell, but for the 1000, those lines are pretty thick looking. It gets a little, it gets a little harder to tell, but it's definitely less than two millimeters. So those are your screen sizes, and that's what you see on this thing. And I'm going to do a little demonstration here for you, which I've already pre-recorded, and I'm going to show you here. Just to show you how tiny the Galesville is, yes, we do this as geologists, you can barely make that out. I don't even know if you can see the grain sizes, if it's focusing or not, all right? It's hard to see, and like I said, it's mostly a fine to medium sand. It's in that range a little bit of coarse, all right? And we can verify that under magnification. We do this and we zoom in. We're gonna start at our 50X, our seven millimeter width. And we zoom in and what we start to see here is we can see the grains still look kind of orange-ish, right? That is due to iron, but it's actually surficial. These grains are transparent to translucent. They are not opaque at all. It's a very clean quartz sandstone. Well, you see here, you can see the grains pretty well. This 50X detail, for most of my purposes, is all I need, unless I'm looking at siltstones or shales, something like that. Then I need to go to the thousand time zoom, which is right here. And as you can see, a lot of that orange color disappears. It looks a little ambery, a little yellowy, but some places it's white. And you can see it's pretty, the grain sizes are pretty equal. They're pretty homogenous. There's not a lot of variation. They're pretty much in between that fine to medium part on our graph. So it, this does confirm our sieve analysis. And occasionally you will see a bigger grain that is a lot bigger than half a millimeter, which is the line for our coarse sand. So we do have some coarse sand. How do I know this is quartz? As you move the microscope around, it's hard to record and do this. Uh, it's easier to do it just by looking at it. You can, the advantage to using this hand microscope as opposed to a fixed microscope is because you can kind of look at the topography a little. You can move that microscope a hair of a little bit and see to the left or to the right of the grid. You change the light coming in to see how it reflects off everything. And the advantage to that is you can tell the luster a lot better. And this stuff, as you can tell, it reflects and lets light pass through. This is key indicator of quartz. As you can see, it's almost all quartz. It, the grains look, other than their size variation, they look almost exactly the same. You get the roundings about the same, and, they, and they're rounded to well-rounded most of them. There are some occasional sub-rounded pieces, but not too many. There's no angular pieces at all. This, there is some feldspar. You have a couple of pieces that will appear either as a translucent dark gray or as a translucent reddish color or some sort of brown color. That, that's, that's a feldspar. That is not likely quartz. So this thing is a clean quartz aronite. There is almost, or I don't want to say there are no lithics, 
but you'll be hard pressed to find any and I didn't see any in this example you're not going to find any lithics so we so as we look across our sandstone here and we use this tool we can get a better it's a, a better feel for what we're looking at behind the light goes through, especially something as translucent as this. For opaque minerals, it doesn't really matter unless you're trying to discern striation direction on feldspars, then it does help a great deal. But I can always show you a granite or something like that another time. Uh, the 1000 on the igneous rocks, on granites, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't do many, any more than 50X. If I'm looking at something like a basalt, I would use this. Right. Just like if I was using something like this, and as I'm doing the Frida, most of the Frida sandstones that I've looked at thus far, I've looked at maybe four or five samples I've collected, they are generally here. There are some that are in this area too, but the vast majority of Frida sands that I've looked at are usually silty or argillaceous, or silty to argillaceous, very fine to find sandstones. And they might have medium sand or maybe fine to medium with some silt. Something like that. They're finer grained is the point of this. I probably will not be able to do too many mechanical analysis on the Frida's sandstone samples unless they're not very well indurated. They're pretty friable and I can break them apart because they are decently indurated. The Galesville is Cambrian. These are pre-Cambrian. The age difference between both of these is about half a billion years and so this is stuff has had more time to get harder so i will show you some of my frida under the microscope and stuff too show you how it diff differs and the frida is also a lot more arcosic and lithic most of the frida sandstones there are very little quartz aronites it interbedded within it siltstones and shales and i have looked at a, a one actually two samples of those and they tend to be more quartz rich. They're still arcoses, but they're closer to that quartz aronite on the QLF diagram. But most of the Frida sands, the stuff that falls within here or here or here, tends to be very arcosic or lithic arcosic sandstone. So we can use things like this to confirm other test methods we've used. This is my uh, 18 sieve, the silver, the steel, Sid sets, the silver colored ones, didn't come with an 18. They skipped it, I don't know why, so I had to buy a brass one independently. And here you can see how some stuff gets stuck in there. And you can get it all out. You generally just use your fingers and tap it lightly and it'll get out for the next sample. So we use one method to get our analysis and the mechanical methods really reliable. And we can confirm it with this. But this, the microscope, our sieve, analysis versus our microscope. Civ pros, microscope pros. I'm not going to do pros and cons because a pro here is generally a con here. A pro here is generally a con here. I'll explain that. But our sieves, what do those do? Those give us a very accurate grain size on sandy to pebbly rock, assuming we can mechanically break it down to do that. A con is, well, what if we can't break it down? We have to go to this. There's no need for physical destruction of the sample. Now, I already stated that you can't do clays and silts very well on a sieve analysis, but your microscope pros with the 1000X that we have there, that I use, I can do any silt stone because silt can be viewed pretty easily with that 1000X. Ah, shales depends. I might have to rely more on this. If it's very silty or very sandy, I can use that as, as a guide because if my shale has a lot of quartz silt and quartz sand in it, the shale is going to be the other stuff. And remember, shales form differently from siltstones and sandstones, okay? Uh, they are formed from the alteration, the chemical weathering of minerals. Siltstones, sandstones, conglomerates are just busted down mechanically weathered rock. So neither method is really good for this, but it can, I can get a better 
representation of my volume percent as opposed to my mass percent with this. A pro for this is I can get actual mass of the grades. You know, if something passes the number five but is retained on the number 10, that interval there, I can get an actual mass. If I'm looking at a rock under the microscope, I can't do that. I have to do that volumetrically, all right? And the two are pretty close generally, and I've done lab work where I've had to translate volume into mass, uh, but those are talks for other times. So we have two sieve pros there. We have two microscope pros there. This can get me that finer detail. I can determine roundness of the grains, the luster, the frosting, if there's any striations. Are the striations parallel like in a plagioclase feldspar? Or are there no striations on the feldspar indicating a case spot unless it's a microcline? Then we have 90 degrees roughly of striations, talks for other times. I cannot determine any of that with a sieve analysis. None of it. This method is quicker. I do dry sieve only. The reason why I do dry sieve only is because as you sieve it and you manually shake it, you're less likely to get individual particles stuck in between the mesh grid. If you, as where if you're pouring water through it, that kind of forces it to push in there and can lock grains in place. This method is quicker, especially when you're only using those seven sieves with a pan. <laughs> you become proficient at this you can easily take it, you take each one on the sieve, you dump the sieve into a beaker which is already teared out on your scale, you get your mass, you find your percentages, it doesn't seem like it's quicker, but it actually is because this, why is this not quicker? Well, I might be able to look using my scope and say, oh yeah, that's a feldspar if I look at it. Oh yeah, that's probably a carbonate, but you would need an acid test to confirm that and a scratch test. We're not comparing those other tests. I use those as well for confirmation. But when you're looking at this, when you're zoomed in a thousand times or close to it, you're seeing that little tiny area. And if you're rocks like this and you're trying to get a volume of the whole thing, you've got a huge area. That takes time. You're writing all these little numbers down in places just to keep track. Oh yeah, this part, I counted this many grains, all that stuff. This is a lot quicker when compared to that. I just wanted to show you my newer toy, that's all. And yes, I mean, you know, I finance all this stuff. Sometimes some people do help, but generally I'd probably say 95% of all, everything you see here is out of pocket. So I don't have the money to be buying really expensive microscopes. So when I start started seeing people online using these and seeing the details, like, oh, yeah, and it does work. I mean, I've looked at many, probably a dozen plus already i mean i post some of them to social media to show you guys and this is a real big help and like i said you know there are other tests and you guys have seen me do them you know you have streak you have hardness you have acid density and those kind of things and using the sieve the microscope and these four additional things so just using these basic six methods, the sieve, the microscope, street hardness, acid density, without even creating a thin section, I can determine the mineralogy and makeup of about 95% of the rocks I look at. There are some things in my books where I can't, they're so small or for whatever reason or they look too similar because a lot of minerals look alike and you would need detailed petrographic analysis. But generally, I can figure it out, classify it pretty easily. Because quite honestly, and I've said this before, I don't know how many times I have to say this, but when people show me pictures like this, if I just got a picture of this, I couldn't tell you heads or tails of it. But I've done a detailed analysis so you can tell what's in the picture. Pictures of rocks, when people are just like, oh Steve, what is this? It's a rock. And it's like zoomed out out of context, I don't know if this was a glacial erratic, found in a riverbed, found in place, I don't know any of that stuff. But doing this stuff, I, that, that I can get about that much confidence 
in my sample analysis without any electron microscope analysis or thin sections or anything like that. I can, I have the ability to do thin sections, but I do not have the cutting tool to do them. And the problem with thin sections is a lot of times the rocks, if you're like the Galesville, they're friable. You're better off just looking at it under a microscope anyway. And the Galesville being translucent, or transparent to translucent, you can get that light through on a slide. You can do polarized, non-polarized, all that other stuff, which is talks for other times too. But anyway, that's it. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And I hope you learned something.